So thanks for joining us. We're going to chat today in our resilience program, thinking about uh, Nehemiah, the incredible story of Nehemiah. Pastor Mark uh, shared a great message about this recently, and and he, he spoke a lot about the courage and and wisdom and capacity of Nehemiah to figure out how to bring positive change in the middle of a very difficult time. You know, we are we in the middle of COVID-19, it's 2020 and it's May and it's been a, a very difficult time. It reminds me of the time when I couldn't pay my electricity bill. That was also a very dark time. And, and in that process, you know, there are days when you feel like I'm, I'm out of my depth. I'm in this place of, of, of really, you know, depressing, challenging, um, contrary circumstances. Certainly that was what happened to Nehemiah. Um, I want to just read to you uh, a passage from Nehemiah chapter one. It says this, when, when I, this is Nehemiah speaking, he said, when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. I mourned for days and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindnesses for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. I love the way Nehemiah translates his depression, his anxiety into prayer. He translates his problem into prayer. I'm actually going to use six P words to describe this journey for Nehemiah because uh, I, I, I heard an incredible series by Pastor Danny Guglielmucci and he talked about Nehemiah in great depth. And, and so I'm stealing his P words today to kind of reflect on, on this process that, that um, Nehemiah finds himself in. What I love about the resilient spirit of Nehemiah is he turns his depression and his grief over what's happening in the city of Jerusalem. And remember, the city of Jerusalem had been overrun by enemies. The walls had been torn down. It had been burned with fire. It was desolate. There were, the people that were living there were overcome and very marginalized. And so in that moment, in that process of, of despair, Nehemiah turns his stress into strategy. He prays, but he doesn't just pray. He then begins to act. And I love the fact that he prays. You know, in our society, prayer is often not thought of as a very appropriate thing. You know, for example, people struggle with the idea of prayer in schools. But can I say, as long as there are examinations, there will always be prayer in schools. Prayer is a a prerequisite for anybody who feels that they are stretched beyond their own earthly capacity. And so Nehemiah prays and he's heard by God. It's an amazing uh, process that he goes through. The second thing that Nehemiah does is that he prepares. He doesn't just pray, he prepares. He goes to the king as the cupbearer to the king. He comes to the king. And, he's, and the king sees that he's disconsolate, sees that he is depressed. And he says, why is your face so downcast? Why are you so grief stricken? And he says these words. Well, you know, how can I not be downcast and broken when my city, the city of my father's lies in ruins? And in that moment, the king says these incredible words. Well, how can I help you? And then this is what he does. He's, with a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. I love that he immediately makes himself available. He does not allow his anxiety, his depression, his fear to stop him from being available to actually go and make a difference in the world. And I think if you're going to have a resilient spirit, you're, you're going to be a person who chooses to clothe yourself with strength, who chooses to bounce back and say, yes, that's a hard situation. But in the middle of that circumstance, I'm going to find a positive way forward. That's what Nehemiah does. 
not only does he do that, but, but the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, he, he comes here with a shopping list. I love this. He says, if it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates, instructing them to let me travel safely. And, and let me have letters addressed to the manager of the king's forest, um, instructing him to give me timber and I will need to make beams and so on. He, he, he has this whole requisition list of things that he needs. He's already thought in advance. He's prepared to face the challenge that he's in with, with incredible wisdom and capacity. And I would want to pause for a moment and just say to anybody in a challenging time, it's worth making a list of what you already have and what you're going to need. You know, whether it's emotional resources or physical resources or financial resources, we all need resource. And usually we find that we will never have enough resource in our current situation to meet the future demands. That's true of business. It's true of families. It's true of life. Uh, my daughter is about to have twin boys and one thing's for sure they don't really have enough room and space and resource to meet the demand of having four children instead of two but the great thing is that they're planning and stretching and growing toward that goal they're planning and preparing for the goal of having more in their life that's the beauty of the kingdom of god he always wants to entrust us with more. He always wants to give you more than you currently have. But if you're going to receive that, you're also going to have to stretch the tent pegs of your house, of your dwelling, of your existence, of your time. It, it, more always means more capacity, more stretching, more resource and more resilience. So Nehemiah prays and he prepares and God gives him great favour. When he gets to the city, he makes immediate steps to fix the city walls. He rebuilds the walls. He mobilizes people. He does this incredible process of, of helping people to be empowered. And by doing that, he, he makes progress. So he, he literally has this process of, of the people that are there being empowered, feeling like they're a team and knowing what their task was. And there's this little verse in um, <clears throat> chapter three. It says this, Then Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They consecrated the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. Next to him, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. And, and so on. I love that process. The priests who were kind of this, you know, holier than thou group technically, basically were all hands on deck. They all jumped in to serve. They all jumped in to fix the ruin of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah was able to mobilize people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds into this one vision of being stronger together of doing something significant together that they could not do on their own. And the rebuilding of the walls basically meant the rebuilding of safety, security and protection for families. In this season that we're in right now, we are in a, going to be in a rebuilding phase coming out of, of the COVID-19 crisis. We're rebuilding our lives and, and as you know, many people might have heard me say in the past, it's an opportunity for us to think differently about how we do life, to think about the way in which we engage with the community at large. And I love the fact as a church that we are looking for ways to resource and encourage people beyond even our own church campuses and locations. We recognise that we have a kingdom responsibility together. So we are called also to celebrate the progress. Nehemiah learned to enjoy the journey, not just the destination. And sometimes we forget to celebrate. 
you know, the, there is this journey we're, we're on and sometimes we're very nervous about it. It's like the guy who falls out of a plane without his parachute and as he's falling, he's saying, well, so far, so good. But, you know, it's not the fall that hurts you, it's the landing. By contrast to that, for us, the reality is that we can take steps of faith and know that we're secure in God's hands. He's more than the parachute to us. He's actually uh, basically our carrier. And, and the beauty of knowing that is that we can celebrate the journey then. We can celebrate the progress that we're making because we recognise that while we haven't arrived, we are in this constant journey of personal and corporate transformation. That's what we're called to do and to be. We're not called to stay the same. We're not called to be complacent about our current circumstances. We're called to be change makers, not just change experiences. You know, lots of people say that change is inevitable, except from a vending machine. But the reality is that change can either happen to us or happen in us. And change that happens in us, we can, we can allow it to happen through us. We can be change bringers, change carriers. We are called to bring a positive change in the world, not just allow the world to dictate to us, not just to be fatalistic about life, but to literally bounce back, bounce forward with capacity. And that's the beauty of enjoying the journey of progress. The fourth thing that happened to Nehemiah was persecution, another P word. So we've had prayer, we've had preparation, we've had progress. But now, unfortunately for Nehemiah, he encounters persecution. He, he, he has these opponents that are just miserable, you know, it's sort of legendary in scripture, actually. They're just so negative. Um, and it, I want to read you a little portion of that. It says this, now it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and he mocked the Jews. He spoke to his, in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore this city for themselves? Can they offer sacrifice? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even these burned ones? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him and he said, even what they are building, if a fox would jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. And Nehemiah heard all of that negativity. But this is what he does with it. He, he literally takes it straight to God. He goes, now listen, hear our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. I love that. He's kind of... Um, He's quite the militant character. Um, that's what I love about the Old Testament. You know, you get to basically, you know, it's an eye for an eye. Uh, anyway, that's a side issue. <clears throat> um, I want to say this. Whatever battle you are in, and let's face it, if you're alive, you're in a battle. Sometimes the battle that's most painful is the battle that's most personal. Very often you and I are most likely to fear most the negativity of those that we love most. The great challenge we face in, in doing life together with intimacy is that we put ourselves at risk to be betrayed or rejected or to be hurt. Negative words, negative thoughts, negative actions can all impinge on our resilience and our soul. But I want to remind you of a couple of thoughts here. The first thing is this, no one makes you feel inferior without your consent. No one makes you inferior without your consent. The funny thing is we would spend a lot less time worrying about what other people think of us when we realize how little they really do. We can spend an awful lot of our life worried about the opinions and negativity and criticism of others when actually we would be far wiser to find our sense of calling and identity and affirmation in who God says we are. No one makes you inferior without your consent. 
And I would urge you to not give consent to those negative criticisms that resound around your head that might have been thrown at you from years gone by. Someone said you'll never amount to anything. Someone says you, you can't speak, you can't lead, you can't do this, you can't do that. You're no good at that. You will never pass that. I, I was told by my, my aunt that I would never graduate anything and uh, in a very public setting. And um, after my fourth degree and, and diploma, I thought I should send her a copy because, you know, if anything, it just became a spur to me to, to go on and to study and to develop fulfilment of those things that God had called me to do. You and I must choose not to give in to inferiority. The feelings of inferiority are a lie and they are designed to rob you of your God-given calling and destiny. I think Nehemiah knew that. He had to rise above their criticism. He had to actually allow them to spur him into positive action. That's what resilience is. Two more thoughts before I finish. The next thing that happened to them was there was a season of postponing. Things that were promised and seemed to be progressing well suddenly were postponed and held and delayed. One of those things was that actually the community of the Jewish people themselves was in, in real bondage, in real despair because of their lack of resources. Some of them said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards, and now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. Yet behold, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters are forced into bondage already. We are helpless because our fields and vineyards belong to others. Sometimes you can feel trapped by what you don't have. But the reality is that we have to stop and take stock of what we do have and be resolute in, in the capacity that God has given to us. With God and our own soul united, we become a majority. We have all the resources we need in Him. The final point that I wanted to leave you with this morning was the idea of prosperity. Many of us think that, that prosperity is a, a, a very inappropriate word to be mentioned in a church context, but I would urge you to consider the, the fact that the word prosper is used over 100 times in the Bible and always refers to the, the desire that God has to bless and prosper your life in every way, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, and every other way. God, the intention is for you to prosper. What he doesn't he doesn't mind you having money, for example. He just minds if money has you. The goal of prosperity wasn't just for our own well-being. The goal of prosperity is that we can be a blessing to others. And God's intention was that, that this city of Jerusalem prosper again. God was restoring what had been torn down. And I love that about this, this journey. We see that Nehemiah fulfills in his lifetime the transformation of a whole city. And out of that comes the community out of which eventually Jesus, our Saviour, is born. So we should all be thankful that he was resilient in this process. But there's one verse I want to leave you with in Nehemiah chapter 2. It's a, I love this verse. It became a signature verse for me in a, in a time of desperate prayer in my own life. It says this, the God of heaven will give us success. Wow, what a promise. And I want to declare that over you today. The God of heaven will give you success. It's not that he, success is the be all and end all. Success is just a sign of you being who you're called to be. God loves you to succeed. He wants you to win and not lose, to succeed and not fail because that's his heart toward you. He's taking delight in you and wants to accomplish all that he has designed you to accomplish. So the God of heaven will give you success. That was Nehemiah's experience. And I think it's still as true today as it was two and a half thousand years ago. God bless you.
Well, we've just heard from Pastor Bruce Robertson around the book of Nehemiah and uh, in our theme of Stronger Together and Resilience. And Bruce, it's great to uh, be able to just expand on some of those thoughts that you shared this morning. Um, I wanted to start out by asking you, obviously with Nehemiah, there was a point where he was actually looking around at his circumstances and was in despair. Um, can you give us some insight into what you think were the key turning point, the key issues that helped him to change his focus from one direction to another? Yeah, thanks, Paul. It, it, it's an amazing thing to think about. Nehemiah is in this incredible role, as many of you would know. He's the cupbearer to the king, mm. and but he's the king of a foreign power, the conquering power, actually, that had kind of overwhelmed, um, you know, the nation of Israel. So effectively, he's a, in a form of slavery. And, and in this position of subjugation, he probably feels like, what can I do? Yeah. And, and like you're saying straight away, he, he's in this moment of despair. He hears that his own city is completely ruined. His people, his heritage, everything that he identified with has kind of been trashed. And what I love about Nehemiah is that he doesn't stay in that framework of despair and depression. He chooses to make uh, something out of that. There's this, however we define this, his resilience is expressed in his capacity to turn his depression into an action, into a positive outcome. And it takes a, a process, you know, as I mentioned in this outline, he starts with prayer, but he doesn't just pray. He, he goes beyond prayer to the point where he actually meets with the king. Mm. And the king says this incredible question, well, what, what can I do to help you? Yeah. And the thing I love about him is that he was totally prepared for that moment. It's like he, he had this incredible list of requisitions that he was going to ask the king for. And in some ways, um, you and I, if we're going to be resilient, we have to come with a shopping list of, for life. Mm -hmm. We have to come to life with this list of things that we, we want and expect and pray for and believe for out of life. Not just out of God, but actually out of life itself. Because in a way, we, when we pray, we ask God, God's going, yes, I'm for you. Mm -hmm. But we have to take our anxiety, our depression, and turn it into a plan of action to change the world. And, and I love the fact that Nehemiah gets to see, at the end of his story, the outcome of his resilient spirit. His resilience, actually, his determination to bounce back and not be overcome, but to push through things, enables him to see this amazing outcome in the end. And, I really love that about the way he, he, he does that. As we were talking about before, Pastor Mark had been talking about you know, Nehemiah and, and the courage and the, the incredible process that he goes through to, to see that sort of outcome in his city. And I guess we're now having to translate that into our own world and context. Mm, yeah. As we're speaking, we're in the middle of a COVID isolation lockdown in 2020 and it's kind of an awkward time but of course the good news the spiritual impact that we have is never locked down yeah. and i think that's yeah. one of the great things about even this opportunity for us to be online together and to continue to to grow in our faith and our knowledge of of what god's intentions are mm. that's a great thought i love what you what you've said about how he had a set of questions. He had a sense of expectation for the opportunities that there might be to make a difference. Um, in this season where people are maybe feeling a bit overwhelmed, is there any lessons from the Amar, any thoughts you can give on how do I move from a position of, um, you know, struggling to see what's ahead to actually now I can see what the opportunities are. I have the faith to believe for mm. the opportunities that God might bring in this season, because there are opportunities in this season, aren't there? <laughs> oh, there are, you know, like I, I, I was thinking, I've got this um, 
all the, a lot of the cafes that I normally go to for coffee have been shut down, but there's this guy who's got this caravan set up on the side of the road and he is making a mint yeah. out, of, <laughs> out of this season right now. He's, yeah. turned, uh, he's turned the lockdown into opportunity and uh, no one has to come into his cafe. He doesn't have to clean it up. He just has a caravan and, and uh, you know, he's turned his stress, if you like, into strategy. Mm. And, and I, I think that's what Nehemiah did so well. He turned his stress into strategy. Mm. The stress was that he grieved about his city, his family, his heritage, um, all that he believed God wanted for his region. And in a way, he fulfills his calling by protecting the heritage and the generation of others. Yeah. And we've been talking about the idea of being stronger together. My identity, my calling, my dream is all locked up in the dreams and callings and, and um, purpose of others. Mm. And when we're part of a community of faith, I think that's where we tend to unlock extra capacity. Yeah. And I find that Nehemiah models a very determined spirit. He, he's very tenacious. He, he knows what his purpose is. He's very single-minded about it, isn't he? He doesn't really yield to opposition and negativity. He just has set his mind about what he's going to do and, and, and what needs to be done. He figures out the detail. He figures out how to take the steps. One of the things I love about Nehemiah too is that he celebrates his progress. Yeah. He doesn't just sort of stay so um, focused on the end that he forgets to enjoy the journey. He really does celebrate the progress that they make as a, as a whole community together. And I think that's the power of vision. When people have a shared vision and, and they bring their collective gifts to it, something happens that would never have happened if Nehemiah had been on his own. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot to love about the way he does life. Re coming back to your question, re relating it into our current world, I think we're in a situation where we have to do what Apple did in the 1980s. They, they came up with this slogan to define their business, which was think different. Mm. And... I think Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And in some ways, we have the knowledge of, the, of what we've experienced, what our history is, what, what we know at this moment. But I would say that our responsibility is to think differently, to, to look at the future and go, well, what sort of society do we want? Yeah. What do we want our city to look like? How can we rebuild the walls of our family and our our community in a, in a positive way yeah. um, that that helps everyone moving forward. Yeah, I love that idea about thinking differently, about having an expectation that God will do something in this season, um, that God will provide opportunities if we just uh, are prepared to do the work and think mm. about what is possible, which we see in the life of Nehemiah. Yeah. Um, I also love the way that he engaged other people in mm. the journey, which you've touched on as well. So just in closing, Bruce, and um, I might get you to pray after that. What do you think um, is a way that people can actually um, initiate something in their own circumstance at the moment, their own neighborhood, their own uh, community that can facilitate what we've talked about, engaging new opportunities and an expectation around what God might do? Oh, that's a great question, Paul. And, and you know, we... You know, we often say this, but in a way, the church exists for the benefit of our non-members. And what that means is that, that yes, we, we love to worship together, and so we should, because worship is, is part of the calling that a church has. But part of our worship is also expressed in what we do for others, mm. because if we love God, we also love people. And I would say that, there's, there's three things that we've always tried to, to honour in the way we do life as a family and also as a church. And that has been to firstly focus on um, how we as a family um, pray together, believe together and uh, focus on 
keeping faith uppermost in our, in our, in our own family life. The second thing is that we serve together. So we pray together, we serve together. We, we actually want to be a blessing. Service is not a dirty word. It's one of the great gifts that we bring to the world. And whether it's serving a coffee with a smile or whether it's actually uh, creating a whole leadership mechanism that changes the community. One of the things we're doing in our Maitland campus has been um, you know, a, a, an ongoing program for homeless people. And I'm very proud of how the team does that. They, they care constantly for people that have had life happen to them in the worst possible way. And I love that our serving heart is reflecting a very practical outcome and it brings positive change. And in a way, it's like Nehemiah, it rebuilds yeah. the walls for people. Hmm. I think the third thing is that we also celebrate together. Um, we enjoy the journey, not just the destination. And I, I would encourage everybody to take a moment in your current frame of reference and, and thank God for the season you're in. Yeah. You know, he has not left us or forsaken us. He loves us and he's for us and he has incredible pathways for us to move forward. And with that note, it's probably good for me to pray mm. Father, I just thank you for everybody listening to these uh, resilience programs. I, I pray that you would help them to bounce back from whatever life throws at them and to recognise that you've called us to be stewards of our life, to bring our life under the leadership and dominion of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you help us to hear your voice and to take those little steps in our own context to make a difference in the world, to be the change we want to see in the world, to help other people everywhere, Lord God, as we're called to. I thank you, Father, that you are the God of hope mm. and that you provide us with incredible hope for our situation. For those that are battling with depression and anxiety, I pray your peace, yeah. your confidence, and your plan to move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Bruce. Appreciate your insight. And uh, look, we're just praying for you all that uh, through this season, there will be an expectation for divine opportunities to open where we can be his hands and feet to those who need him the most. God bless you. <laughs>